I changed my mojo like four different times when I started because I was like, I love this subject. Oh, actually I don't. I love this subject. Actually I don't. Just learning how to share my voice in public, doing it authentically and just getting practice talking in public. It felt like really it was more for me and my growth than caring about numbers, impressions or likes or like needing it to make money. Dr. Jessica Bielstahl has lived in Saudi Arabia, is the sports pharmacist. She can lift the equivalent of me over her head while standing up. And she's secretly an artist and Jessica lives in paradise. She has been one of my dear friends that I met on LinkedIn years ago. And she was my poor guinea pig for the first program that I ever started and is now just a good friend who's showing other white coats and patients how pharmacists can stand out in the world and help the world in their own unique way. Introducing Dr. Jessica Bielstahl. And the reason I brought Jessica in is for three big reasons. One, she's just genuinely doing something really cool with her pharmacy background. Two, we regularly have really cool conversations and I want other pharmacists to be a fly on the wall and listen in because most pharmacists don't talk this way to each other about starting a business, money, fears, inspirations, and hiking. <laughs> just a good idea. And because we just met together last month in Florida when I was out there for a conference and we walked in the dark for hours and we just talked and talked and I selfishly want to record that conversation and to keep us going. So we should Jessica, have. welcome and thank you so much for coming today. Thank you for having me. The first me. question I want to ask you is, give us just a quick snapshot of your life and background in pharmacy. I'm talking like 60 second resume. Pharmacist for 15 years, working at independent pharmacy, really big into health and wellness. I've been an athlete my whole life and have now figured out how to marry sports and um, pharmacy together. That was like your 15 second intro. I love it. <laughs> Well, that's what I wanted to talk about. So you had a background in independent pharmacy. You still work as an independent pharmacist, but you started like a really cool side hustle where you marry your passion with your degree and it's not, they're not separate anymore. And so tell me about your experience with sports to start with and personally brag about what you're doing with competing. I'm not so good at that part. Um, so I've been an athlete my entire life. My um, I played sports all through high school. I played Division One volleyball. I got after pharmacy school, kind of used uh, CrossFit as a means to continue to compete. Then I got into high-level Olympic weightlifting. I realized that I was pretty good at an individual sport after playing team sports my whole life and started competing in Olympic weightlifting, which is snatch and clean and jerk, which is what you see on the Olympics, like the really funky movements. Competed nationally. And then competed internationally. Um, and so last year I competed in the world championships and got third. The year before that, I set a world record and snatch for my age and weight class. And um, it's kind of ironic that I actually do Olympic weightlifting, I think. So I, when I was in college, um, I dealt with a, an eating disorder. And so now I compete in a weight class sport, which is kind of the weirdest thing. But I felt like it was a big part of my recovery was to be able to get back into sports and playing a sport that it not judge for my weight, but being judged for how I compete is was pretty like healing for me in an odd way. But um, weight weightlifting is actually a drug tested sport. And so I started um, when I was in pharmacy school and afterwards started having a lot of people reach out to me and ask, hey, what supplement's best? How can I improve the recovery? Um, how can I improve my sleep? How can I get stronger? How can? And so we were I started diving into nutrition and that kind of helped me and also was able to utilize that with other friends. And then we started looking at supplements and how they played a role. And so I kind of just started just on the side, just as a friend. And it really kind of fits who I am and kind of how I see medicine with like using food and supplements and skills that a lot of us underappreciate, like sleep and nutrition and mindset work to actually heal or to become better. So it's progressed to now working with organizations and clubs and athletes one-on-one -on -one on optimizing their performance, both on the field and off the field. So 
Okay, you have to brag. How much weight can you like lift up over your head with that clean and jerk where you like get it up and then lift it so, over? How much weight, Jessica? My best clean and jerk is 245 pounds. And <laughs> is it bad if I say it like I like I'm, I sit about 175 pounds. So it does so well over my body weight of um over my head. <laughs> Over your head, not like a bench press or like a bicep curl. You're like lifting it from the ground to from the ground to your shoulders standing. <laughs> and I will tell you, if you ever, if you ever watch, it's really funny. People always laugh because I'm the only person that like completely smiles through the whole thing. So it'll be like really heavy. And I'm like, <laughs> of course you are. Of course you're smiling. Everyone else is like frowning and straining. And you're like, I always have Check a smile. Out my like people are always like, you're the only one that smiles. I'm like, I, I just, I enjoy. I've gotten past the point of like competing to prove something, to competing for the joy of it and the challenge. And so I think it makes it a lot more pleasurable when I compete is because I want to do it and I enjoy it. And so um, why not smile? Like if I'm not enjoying it, I shouldn't be doing it. <laughs> In so many aspects of life, I think that's true. And something that I remember w us talking about in Florida, in paradise, was the aspect of sports that a lot of people have trouble with, that they're trying to follow the rules, but you can be taking what you assume is like a, something that will help you that actually will turn up on a drug test. Am I remembering that right? Like, talk yeah. me through how yes. careful athletes have to be and how you as a pharmacist and as the sports pharmacist can help people uniquely that way. Yeah. So there's a lot of drug, a lot of athletes that are drug tested, NCAA athletes, Team USA, a lot of CrossFit. There's a lot of different um, UFC, everything's drug tested. And so there are some supplements over the counter, like one that comes to mind, two of them that are pretty popular that I see athletes that don't realize like DHEA, you, it's a banned substance. And so like people don't realize when you're getting like these testosterone boosters or these muscle boosters, they may have DHEA in them. Um, Sudafed is another one. People think, oh, I'm just sick. I'm going to take Sudafed before I go compete because I'm, I have symptoms and it's totally not legal. You'll, it's a, it'll test a positive on a drug, on a drug test. So knowing, being able to know how to handle one, the regulations of supplements, like we all know as pharmacists, it's not, it's a wild west out there and being able to find, educate athletes as to what they're taking and really help them assess why do they need that or do they need the supplement for sleep um, because they're drinking caffeine late in the evening. Well, then let's assess the caffeine use instead of the su adding the supplement in. So really being able to look at what, why, and how they're utilizing these supplements and um, if they're really going to provide a benefit over the risk of taking a banned substance, um, possibly, or something that may be adulterated and or have a substance that you didn't know was in there. So I do a lot of that, but it is a, it is something that it's a careers of athletes that could be one pop test can sit you out two to four years. It's kind of scary. Yeah, so. it's so much to lose. Especially if you're not trying to cut corners and like you're just trying to be healthy and like do the best you can. So I love that role for a pharmacist to help really high athletes perform well and also get the correct substances in their bodies and like pass tests and also get things that actually work. Yeah, it's neat to work with athletes to try and help with like conditions that they're struggling with and find and be able to have a conversation with like a physician and say here's your options I know these are the three choices this one may not be the best because it's banned or this one because of side effects and really um, a couple of the physicians around us are like wow like thank you I appreciate that I would never have thought like you know like propranolol is banned and it's used in migraine prevention so weird things you wouldn't think about that impact a performance and also a condition. Yeah, if you go to the doctor, propranolol would be a totally normal prescription for a migraine. But if it's a banned substance, that might not be on your radar because it's not one of those ones you have a gut feeling like, well, obviously, I can't take something like this. That's so interesting. Talk to me more about, you've been working with elite athletes, but I also remember that you're working with like 
high school high students school. and like not only like Olympic level, the absolute feats of human strength. Give me a, your journey of how people started reaching out to you, what services you started providing and like what this actually looks like in helping someone as a sports pharmacist. A lot of my initial clients came through working with being just with my team and the people I was around in sport. And then I kind of started on social media posting health topics, stuff that was, thanks, Jamie, for the encouragement, topics that were really more geared to things that I guess the best way to put it would be stuff that I wish I had known earlier as an athlete, especially being a female athlete, one that struggled with body image, one that struggled with strength, and one that struggled with like an eating disorder. And so being able to, I kind of reached out to a couple of the high school coaches I knew. I either played for them, know them as a friend. They were on a team with me and said, hey, would you be interested in having a pharmacist come and talk to your athletes on some nutrition and supplements and basically energy drinks also. But they were like, yes, we have nobody that does that. They don't know. We don't have any resources. The first couple of times I was like, okay, trying to find my groove and figure out how that goes and asking for feedback and then asking them to connect me with another coach that might be, they find might find my talk beneficial. So that's kind of how it's kind of spread out. I have now found most of my clients from giving talks and from social media. So um, that's kind of how most of my clients come now is through giving webinars or podcasts or talks and people reach out and say, hey, I've never heard of this. And or, you know, your posts really resonate with, you know, females and your strengths or females and body image or hormones and stuff like that. So I still do a lot of um classes or seminars with teams. And I really enjoy that part because I feel like I can touch a lot of lives and give back. I used to used to dream of wanting to coach like as in like, you know, with a whistle and a clipboard on the sidelines. But I still work in retail um, in an independent pharmacy. And um, I was never really able to because the hours were weird and they would practice at 3.30 or 4 afternoon. And I'm like, I, I don't get out of work by then. So um I've kind of come to, you know, I was guided to coach in a different way and coaching athletes on their health and wellness and their mindset and their nutrition is just as vital as being the coach on the court. So I kind of tell people I coach in a different way now, but it kind of fulfills me in a very positive way. I love that. That because what you start doing or what you want to do, like you never know until you start how it's going to pivot and like kind of find that groove but like you just have to start with that first heart impulse of like what do I want to do I'm just going to follow that and see what happens because you can't predict step 20 until you've done steps one two and three yeah and I mean there was a lot of stuff that I was like I think they'll they'll really want this and what I thought and then what they wanted were different but it wasn't in a bad way it was a way that pushed me I felt like it pushed me it outside my comfort zone a little bit and I had to be authentic and tell tell them you know yeah sure this is the pressures of being an athlete and body image and stuff you're going to come across and we had to have tough talks about like menstrual cycles and hormones and how much food you should be eating and that it's going to be more than the person next to you that's not an athlete and you're going to be different and it's okay to be strong it's okay to stand out and you know, that made me kind of go back and be like, wow, this is stuff I wish I knew I knew younger. And I still like doubt myself sometimes, but I feel like that kind of transitioned over into the same thing of like starting a business and be going out on your own. Like you expect like, okay, you're gonna be a pharmacist, you're gonna do this and you're gonna be an athlete and this is gonna happen. And then all these other pressures and things that you really want to achieve and strive for, you have to kind of go outside the mold in order to meet that. That. Just we're on the same wavelength. That was the exact segue I wanted to go into <laughs> that. Like we had the same experience when I started first seeing patients with precision medicine and going through their pharmacogenomic report. I thought they would really want to like dive deep into drug metabolism. And like I can show them pictures of like 
the drug cascade pathway because it's so cool. And it's patients so were like, they wanted that information, but they were basically like, can you just go through each of these medicines and tell me what they're for? I'm just like, I'm, I mean, yeah, I could do that, but don't you want to know about this? And they're like, yeah, that's fine. But like, I just want to know, like, do I need to be taking these? Is there a cheaper drug? This is so expensive. And so I thought they wanted like depth level 20. They just wanted like to scratch the surface on stuff that we take for granted that I would, we think is like, well, that's obvious. Everyone knows that. Or like, but really it's not. And we undervalue what we can teach the world because we feel like, well, that's, it's so obvious. People just know that when they don't. And they do. Do you have an I, example? Like, you kind of did, but like, do you have an example of that? Yeah. I will tell you carbohydrate. What's a carbohydrate? What's a protein? What is a fat? With like my high schoolers, how much do you need to eat in a day? Why NSAIDs have a GI side effect and why caffeine affects your sleep? Like, I, you, you're like, yeah, because it's a stimulant. <laughs> and this is what it does. And like, they're like, you sit there and you tell a, a kid, you're like, hey, that caffeine. It stays in your body for, you know, six to 10 hours, depending on how you metabolize it. And you're on birth control pills, so it's even longer. But so that's why you're not sleeping well and you're going to need caffeine. And they're like, oh, I don't need to know any of it. Caffeine affects my sleep. Okay, so what can I do instead? Like, I'm like, and like, and like, you know, just like stuff. I'm like, that. so I thought I was like, I needed to go into depth. And it was like, no, I just needed to connect, give them a little bit of information, kind of why it's important and they're good they're like okay well what what action steps can i take and i think that's a part that we miss often is giving them the information but giving them an action step or two that they can take to make a change then instead of just giving them information because we think people need information and the more information they have the better people don't need information everyone can look things up online Every everyone's googling everyone's watching tiktok for information it's not information you need it's someone making it personalized to you and helping you solve a problem. Yes. That's yes. what people need is yes. personalization and problem solving. Yeah. And they just want, they want somebody that will listen to them, which I agree. Everyone, again, personalization. And then how does that apply to me and what action steps can I take today to see a change in the near future? Not how do I lose 50 pounds? Okay. Well, today we're going to work on hydration and you can drink half your body weight in water or something like that like an easy step and then they feel progress um probably back to kind of what we were talking to before we went on was you know how like paying off debt you snowball it like the same thing works i feel like with health is like little steps add up to big to big results but you kind of need those somebody to help guide you along with those skills and those steps yeah and to recognize the the framework of your teaching and the information of what you teach is important but more important is like is it helping someone and what do they need next to actually apply it to their life and i don't think we think that way as pharmacists or white coats we just think like information 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 when it's an age of information they yeah. need someone I would, who's I think looking I was... them in the eye and saying like do you understand what questions do you have next? Like, what have you learned online? What questions do you have for me? Let's make this personal for you. And that's where we can shine. And I love to go back to social media. I love that you are on social media and sharing this with the world because so many white coats are afraid of social media and they feel like they have to be a certified expert and have all the cute posts and just be a certain personality or have a certain amount of education before they can share online. When really, like, you just have to start with your experiences and what you do know now. What advice, after posting on social media for several years, what do you wish you knew a couple of years ago that you've found out now, Jessica? Um, How to use scheduling software. <laughs> how to use software. <laughs> so you can schedule posts. That was a big <laughs> light bulb for me, a moment for me a year in. I, was I didn't like, know that. No, like that. I mean, that was like a game changer. I was like, <laughs> I would like email, email myself the post and like the attachment. <laughs> <laughs> I did too. And I really thought like people are posting. Like I was doing the middle of dinner, like, oh, hang on kids. It's time for a post. And then like, 
the thing I wish I would have known earlier is just being authentic. And it's okay if the post is not correct. If it wrong sentences, if it, because sometimes I'm pretty sure my brain works way faster than my fingers. And so there's words that are left out and like, okay. I mean, I was like a perfectionist through and through. And now I'm just like, okay, that's great. Let's go. If I don't do it now, I'm going to spend another four hours on it. So, um, but I think being authentic and like your true self is scary and difficult and definitely didn't start that way. But looking back, when you kind of look over the stuff, like those are the posts that resonate the most with people is the things you're most passionate about and the things that you have a story to go with. And so I think that is if I would have had the confidence earlier to do it would have been more impactful. But I think starting how I did brought that confidence out. And if you just think about like the two options, we think we want to be like this perfect pharmacist with all the facts and figures that people want to hear. But really being authentic Jessica, who's talking openly about an eating disorder that she had and the struggles and what she's learned as an athlete, you as a human are way more compelling than this like perfect clinical person who's just spouting off like fun facts and numbers. People don't want facts and numbers. They want stories. They want help. They want someone who understands. And I love that you've brought that and been really vulnerable with something that most people would like, oh, I can't share that. They won't think I'm perfect if I share like real life struggles of what I've gone through. Can you like talk with me about that? Yeah. So that that took a lot um, to be able to say that and say, I mean, obviously, most pharmacists feel like they have a perfectionist side to them. Um, that may be a spectrum. <laughs> but um, and I think that and the fear of failing or feeling like I failed were two things that really held me back. I don't know if there was like one moment when I first told the story of like having an eating disorder and having to go through feeling insecure and feeling like I don't fit in, but it slowly came out over time and healing journey kind of, I would kind of give some little bits here and there and uh, kind of was like, okay, people resonated with it and people would ask questions and I was like, okay, nobody nobody's I didn't fail nobody's judging me on that and then I kind of grew and I feel like learned that by not pushing myself outside the box and trying to conform with what everyone thought I should be I was not being true to myself and that really was really impactful for me was realizing that I no one's going to love me less. I usually end all my talks and tell everybody, like, you're always enough the way you are. You're not less because you failed at something. You're where you're loved no matter what. So that is really big and helped me realize that, you know, I'm not no matter what I do. And if I can make one person's day, whether that's a smile, whether that's a skill that they learned or something like that, that that really heals me and really helps. So that makes me feel like I'm not failing and I'm authentic. So I think those were the two biggest things along the line. But I feel like that came along with also starting my own business, that I needed that authenticity and not feeling failing at the same time. It's something that I experienced too, and it's been really a joy and like an outlet. And I didn't start posting on social media because I want like, I want people to pay me money. So I'm going to start with like this offer and people can pay me is from day one. I was just a creative expression of sharing what I love with the world and even figuring it out. I changed my like mojo like four different times when I started because I was like, I love this subject. Oh, actually, I don't. I love this subject. Actually, I don't. And then like just learning how to share my voice in public, doing it authentically and just getting practice talking in public. It felt like really it was more for me and my growth than caring about numbers, impressions, or likes, or like needing it to make money. It really just felt like an artistic expression and finding what it is I want to do in the world while letting people publicly be a part of that. Yeah. That I know that totally resonates. Feel like how it was for I you? Would, no, I feel like that is 100%. Like I kind of 
you know, I put it out there. It kind of helps me. I don't really look at like numbers on social media posts, but I can feel like you feel like the comments or the likes and you're like, oh, this resonates with other people. This is either confirmation I, I'm on the right path or you're like, yeah, like this is people are wanting more of this information and I really like it. So maybe I should explore this path. And it's not something I thought, again, pivoting to what the people want and it's something I enjoy. So why not explore it? It nothing's really going to go wrong. Like you can always go back. And so it's always one of those paths to walk down. You're like, okay. Um, but I feel like social media, there's always so much stuff in my brain and I couldn't turn it off. And it was kind of like, sometimes like, you know, I'm just going to put this out there. Like I have this information. I have this stuff, like maybe I'll share it and see what people like, don't like, but I, I get it out of my head. So. <laughs> Me too. And I have the same philosophy of like, okay, I'm just going to write this down and just share it right now instead of overanalyzing it or wonder what people think or trying to make it perfect, I think that makes it more compelling. The way information is consumed and put out there, like you just have to get in the habit of putting what's in your head down quickly and just get in the habit of like, good idea, I'm going to share it because it's it's that process of being a creator and building in public because people tell you what they want. When they tell you what they want, then you can offer services for it that has already been validated and that there's interest in. So you're actually offering something people already want rather than building in secret for two years and having this like amazing logo with services that no one has told you they wanted and then showing up and like, hey world, buy from me. No one knows you. If they're not, you're, you started two years too late. Like, and I nobody think can, you may not, they not, they not even want that service. Like you can create all this stuff. No, and they don't even want it. It's just what you like, thought they wanted. Like, I don't want, I don't need that. I don't want that. And you're like, I feel like it's free. It's like almost free beta testing for you. Cause you put it, you put an idea. It out is free people. beta testing. <laughs> and like, and again, like you said, I feel it's also practice for skills you want to grow. So I need to learn how to communicate better. I need to learn how to talk on camera better or how to public speak or how to write copy or stuff like that. And so you get that opportunity to do all of that. And then you get feedback, good or bad, <laughs> and kind of helps validate where you're going without having to spend any money or anything. And they tell Even you what better. You it's like a real life internship, but it's an asset you are growing and you're always going to own because it's your brand. So no matter where you work or what you do, you're all of this energy is going into something that's ultimately bigger than you and that can stay with you for your life. It's not just like, well, I'll just try this thing. It is training you to set yourself apart from the rest of our profession who's so scared to go on camera that they won't. Meanwhile, there's like, I, I say this all the time, I'm probably offending yoga instructors, but like Joe Schmo yoga instructor is talking about sports and they have a great area of sports and like they can teach about stuff. But when, how much more valuable is a sports pharmacist teaching about drugs you should avoid, caffeine metabolism? You set yourself apart by your education. People want to learn from you. We're just not getting online because we're too scared. But by doing so, we're not helping anyone. You're not helping anyone. You're just keeping it to yourself. And I feel like you're doing you're doing yourself a disservice and that you're not sharing the joy and the knowledge and the information and your passions with others. Like there's so many people out there that have stuff that would benefit other people and they they're scared to share it. And you're like, but it's important and people need to hear it, whether that be you know, like you said, it could be a yoga instructor. It could happen to be with like abuse victims or something like that. Some people getting mm -hmm. their story out mm -hmm. and how they got out of a situation may impact one person's life. And, uh, you know, it's yeah. And in school, like I felt like you had to like conform to this box and you can't say anything outside of this box. And these are the clinical guidelines. And I'm like, but we don't talk about like there's other stuff and there's other skills and there's other stories that can help impact it. And so. I think breaking out of that shell and that mindset is hard. Some people like black and white, and I feel like kind of what we do is gray. It's very gray. And to be able to pull lifestyle, life experience, and passion in with medication specialty is where pharmacists want to shine because we don't actually love medicine. Actually, the like, healthy fear of it 
And so to be able to help people in a way that's not just so zoomed into managing medications, but to bring your whole self, your passions and a flavor of medication expertise on top that sets you apart. Like you have the credentials. You are the expert. You're the only one that's holding yourself back by just True. staying small. True. True. You're totally just trying to conform and fit in and it's okay to stand out is okay. I always tell people it's okay to be strong. It's okay to stand out. It's okay to be different. Why do we want like 5,000 of the same people? Like you have unique talents, unique stories, like share it and be strong and be confident in it. And it will make a huge difference. Dr. Jessica Bilstahl, you are a wealthy white coat and I believe in wealth in being measured in so many different ways in life. In what area of your life right now are you developing wealth? professionally like self like on myself like so doing some some courses on kind of just mindset and business growth I needed that to kind of help me grow a little further and have a little more confidence going forward um not something I got in school I don't have any undergrad degrees in business so that and I feel like I'm also growing in wealth and connections so that has been so helpful to have social like social media that one thing i love about it is the connections it has brought and getting me with connecting me with people that are like-minded and encouraging and having other strong women in my network which is kind of hard i feel like as an adult to have and find so um i'm super grateful for that and really kind of working on connections Thank goodness for LinkedIn. It seems crazy that without creating a LinkedIn uh, account three years ago, I would not know you. I would have no idea you existed and I need you in my life. And (laughs) it's amazing that like now with technology and the internet, you can find anyone you want and anyone who's like minded like you. And you don't have to settle with the people you work with who are grumbling and hate their career and are just clocking in and clocking out. You can be surrounded by people who are just ahead of you and like stretching you and help you be the person you want to be, even when it gets hard. And your peers may say like, "Mm, just give up. It's not a big deal. Yeah, no, I think that's been the most thing is like having, like seeing you succeed. And like, I remember still beta tests. (laughs) And like, but seeing how far you've come, it's like, wow, she's like, you've grown so, like you've blossomed. It's grown so much. But it's like, it's inspiring and it's also, gra- I'm so thankful I can always, like, if I have a question, I know I can ask. And being able to have that network of even when you come in town, like, hey, can we grab dinner? And who else walks for two and a half hours? And <laughs> But uh, it, it, yeah, I, and to be able to text someone, these like questions are like, I'm stuck. Just to have that and just the knowledge to have that. Anyway, it does a lot. I love wealth of network and relationships because I didn't know about that for 10 years and had no professional no, I think, other I than mean, the people I, I mean, worked with you came out of retail too so like you understand you were confined to this box and you're the the walls of your store and that you know maybe you got to a a conference here and there and you connected and you're nope. like that rejuvenation no none i did nothing no conferences no pharmacy organizations i just clocked in and clocked out jessica you think i was too cool no you're confined to the four walls of your pharmacy and you know it kind of eliminates the rest of that curiosity of what's going on and what can i be doing and you get complacent and just keep going and going and then you know sometimes that sparks you know that connection sparks because that was like right you when we connected was before i even started my own business and so seeing you grow and do that and then a couple other female pharmacists that I have connected with is just, you know, seeing how they grow and develop. It's always, you're like, wow, I can do this. And you know, you have that support system if you need it, which is super helpful. Because if you're in a pharmacy, like you said, you're surrounded by people that may not like their job, or you may be surrounded by people that are just like, I'm okay with doing this for 25 years. And I was not okay with that. And when when you go to say like, I'm connecting with a prescriber in my area and we're going to start collaborating like to have someone who knows what that took and how much you can do with it like you got to celebrate those and congratulations yeah, that was that made way. my day today was being able to connect with a local prescriber and know that i can 
offer services as a pharmacist outside of a retail or hospital setting in a clinic and make an impact on a primary care office. I was like, this is this is what I dreamed of pharmacy being when I first started. And I'm pretty sure one of my professors told me like, yeah, that's just keep dreaming, girl. <laughs> like, it was like 15 years ago, but it's cool to start seeing that come come full circle and be like, I got there. It was a windy path and there's a lots of learning along the way, but I feel like sometimes to get to your dreams and your goals, it's not a straight straight shot and there's obstacles and setbacks and it's kind of it's like sports. It's like recovering from an injury. It's like most of life. So gotta roll with it. And just keep the long term goal in mind and like what you want is gonna take time. And the more patient you can be and the more willing you're able to not accept quick rewards and those quick dopamine hits, you can do so much if you're not just so focused on hitting uh, incredible metrics right out of the gate. If you just like slowly plod every day and do like one thing for yourself every day, even if it seems so little, like it doesn't matter, those habits over months and years and decades that everyone else is discrediting, like, well, that's dumb. It's so little. You actually set yourself up beyond reach. For business, for profession, for habits, for health, for my athletes. Like, I feel like it's those little things. Like, I usually, it's like the little boring things. Like, today I looked at scheduling software. I was, you know, like, you, like, it didn't seem like much, but in the long run, I'm going to be able to do this. Or I, you know, I connected with this person and I spent 45 minutes on the phone, or today I only had five minutes and I did. X, Y, and Z or whatever. And, you know, those little things, like you said, just being consistent with yourself and your goal and like not settling for those dopamine hits or the big flashy things like on Instagram or LinkedIn that you're like, today I completed this entire course and I sat down and did it because I hadn't done it. Or, you know, I got this contract, but all the stuff leading up to that and celebrating those wins along the way It makes it so you don't burn out and you really enjoy it. So really celebrating and loving the process. We talk about that a lot in sports, but I feel like it applies to business is that really loving the process and finding joy in those little day-to-day wins is huge for success. And not being an adult. That's so boring. Like just actually have fun with what you do and don't kill it with expectations. No, for sure. Like have fun. It's Sometimes I think I don't have, I'm not, I'm in my office, but I don't have it. I have a picture of me as like a little kid that I keep on my desk sometimes. So when I like have a bad day or remember it, I just kind of look at that and be like, you know, you've done pretty well for yourself. This little kid dreamed of, you know, I dreamed of playing division one sports, accomplished that. I dreamed, I thought I wanted to be a vet, but I couldn't stand to put down an animal. So we pivoted and went to pharmacy school, but um, I had dreams of like, higher education and helping others. And so like, sometimes I just keep that picture by me and I'm like, hey, you know, you've achieved a lot and it's okay to be a kid sometimes and to have fun and to like shake out the stress and shake out the struggles of the day and go outside, kick a ball, lay in the grass, sit in the sun. Like it's so healing and so impactful to just be free and loose and not death and that does so much agreed we're gonna have to have another episode of just talking about like introducing play to life and for more information on jessica and to find out what she's doing check out the links below where you can connect with her online and follow her journey because she's a wealthy white coat doing some really cool things to marry sports with her pharmacy knowledge thanks for joining us today jessica thanks for having me